Okay, good morning everyone, or good afternoon rather. Hello Richard, hello Wendy. Good morning. Hello. Hi. Okay, so for those um, who don't know um, who they're looking at, so I'm Marcus Pietzia, CEO of um, Zeusoft, the company behind Redoropus, and I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. Oh, Wendy. I'm Wendy Jensen. I'm uh, one of the authors of the New World Veterinary Repertory. And I'm Richard Pitcairn. I'm the other author of the Preparatory. Okay, and great. And I both have been in veterinary practice exclusively, uh, that form of medicine for, well, for me, about 40 years. How about for you, Wendy? Let's see. I guess I started in 94. Wow. Okay. A, a few years back, I would say. Um, <laughs> and l let me just say, guys, how excited we are um, of, you know, having, um, you know, your repertory. Uh, which we know is going to be an immense uh, addition, a really important, you know, resource for all the veterinaries out there who use Red Ropus. Um, so we're really happy about this. And really the purpose of this, uh, you know, this video call is really just to show all of our users uh, a little bit of the repertory and just ask, you know, a few questions that may help them understand what the repertory really is all about. Um, so I'm imagining, you know, a fully working veterinary using Red Ropus. They know your repertory is out there. So I guess the first easy question, you know, that comes to my mind is, you know, what are the sources uh, for the New World Veterinary Repertory? Well, the main book behind our repertory is Boger's Boninghausen Repertory, and we use that as the base. And once we started with that book, then we added in, we went to Kent because he's got a lot of rubrics that aren't in Boninghausen. Mm. And then we also looked through JAR, JAR's new manual of the Homeopathic Materia Medica. That was a really good one. Again, unique, some unique uh, rubrics in there. And then finally, we added in some from Boger's Synoptic Key. So those are the four main ones. Um, we did, in addition to using those as the main sources, we looked at some additions from NARES. K-N-E-R-R, -R, his repertory, as well as Boraki. And then we went to Supplementaria Medica and added our own rubrics based on what the re remedies look like in the ah. Materia Medica. So we looked at Herring's Guiding Symptoms. We looked at T.F. Allen's Handbook, Hughes' Cyclopedia, um, H.C. Allen's The Nozode, so we could have some Nozodes in there. Oh, wow, okay. Uh, and yeah. And Schutz's new and old forgotten remedies. And then we didn't leave out, of course, Hahnemann's Materi Medica Pura in chronic diseases. <laughs> and then finally, we wanted, because in veterinary medicine we deal with wounds a lot, we mm. use a Schwartz wound repertory to put in a lot of um, rubrics from that. So it's, it's got wow. a lot of material in it. A lot, yeah. I was trying to make like mental notes, but it's impossible. Um, and we also but, added, uh, we also added in. Uh, there's a repertory that um, my colleague Joy Dunn, who was working for me back in the uh, late '80s, uh, put together as a research project a cancer repertory based on our study of these same sources that she's talking about, and so we included that as well. Fantastic. As, as I'm guessing, in general, you know, cancer in animals is really an increasing thing. Oh, yes. Um, you know, they yes. They're saying so, now you know. the veterinary profession is predicting some breeds of dogs, half of them will have cancer in their lives. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Um, and, and just, uh, I mean, to stay on actually both topics, I mean, the first repertory that you mentioned was Burning Housen. Now, um, or Boger, actually. Is there one main one that you chose over the other ones in terms of percentage of the ones that you look at? You're talking about the yeah. Bodinghausen? Yeah. Yeah, so you're comparing it with a the therapeutic pocketbook? Yeah, yeah. No, we didn't use a the therapeutic. We used uh, the Boger edition of the Bodinghausen repertory. And okay. the reason for that was that Boger was very, I think he was very sharp. He really understood Bodinghausen's work. And what he did, a wonderful uh, compilation of all of Bodinghausen's uh, material into one repertory and made it much more accessible. And so I found, I had found from my experience that that repertory was the most useful one for, for my 
veterinary work. Okay, that makes sense. And so, um, would you say so? You know, you use that as the core of. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're obviously yeah. okay. That was the foundation. I would say, wouldn't you say, Wendy? I'm just guessing. Ninety percent or more of it is from that repertory. Oh yes, yes, that's a good figure. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I I guess as a as a bit of information that helps the user also understand what they can expect. Um, you know, when they go and they use it. Okay. And well, that's um, a good point, Marco, because um, you, to really use it. Um, in a skillful way, you do have to understand the, that repertory and how it was put together, the philosophy right. behind it. You have right. to understand Bonihausen's work, basically. Yeah. yeah. Which I, I would hope most homeopaths would have as the basis of, uh, you know, their homeopathic, you know, uh, knowledge anyway. You know, you, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. And uh, just out of personal curiosity, how long would you say it took you guys from you know, step one, okay, I wake up today and I decide I'm going to do a repertory to, I guess, the first more or less finished edition. Huh. Well, Richard, you should probably start answering this because I came on after <laughs> you, had, you were underway. <laughs> but, but it was many, many years. It was quite. I had, I had the idea, um, Marco, of a, of a veterinary repertory for quite a long time. I, I could see the usefulness of it. It's not that the other, it's not that the Boninghausen repertory and the Kent repertory were not sufficient. It's just for veterinarians, there's a lot of material we can't use in those repertories. Mm. And so it takes time skimming through it, trying to find the rubrics we want to find. Uh, and also um, flipping back and forth between Kent, uh, this is what I did anyway, I flip back and forth between Kent and Boninghausen to, to work my case. So I could see the value of, of having a repertory focus for that work. And so I had, um, I, I should say, started that. I guess you could say started that project several times, and, and then it didn't complete. Um, I was busy myself with many things. And then when I would um, try to find somebody to work with me on it, uh, it for, for one reason or another, it didn't go forward until I encountered Wendy. And Wendy was willing and dedicated, and so she she actually got into the position of working on it and stimulating me to continue. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. And, and let me just say, you, you know, something, and this comes, you know, from my own experience also working, you know, with Fred Scroyens and with a lot of our authors. You know, sometimes, you know, we, you know, our, our core, uh, in, you know, aim is to help homeopaths worldwide. And, you know, we, we actually sell, you know, books through the software. And sometimes I hear homeopaths saying, oh, you know, why that book is that expensive and that thing and, you know, the other thing. And, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing it's the same for you guys, but people sometimes do not understand the amount of years of work that there are behind a book, which don't stop. It's, a, it's an ongoing process that will probably go on for as long as the three of us are alive. You know, it's, just, it's non-stop. And it's, uh, if you're not passionate about it, you just can't do it. Because in terms of, it, it's just not worth doing it, really. It, it's, it's more of a personal thing, you know? Mm -hmm. That's right. You really have to have your passion to keep you going. Because when you're looking at the 300th rubric for the day and the 18,000 remedy to put in there, yeah. it does get tiring. <laughs> and but your eyes start watering. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In fact, I, I was going to say, Wendy, I can see you wearing glasses. I don't know about Richard, but here are my glasses. I'm, I, was, I was just hiding them. <laughs> and there was a, there's a lot of background work in this, as well as our experience in our study. But yeah. like, for example, I had learned uh, on my Mac computer, I had learned how to do some programming. Hmm. And so I um, put together a little program where I could select a rubric from Kent and a rubric from Boninghausen, and, and, and the program would then combine the two for me. Fantastic. And then we could export that into our repertory. So that was really handy, but it just gives you an idea of, how, of what we had to do. How much stuff, practical. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and then, of course, uh, Wendy's husband has done a lot of work for us also editing. Uh, so it, it yeah. does a lot of back work. <laughs> yeah, back, back. Yeah, based and, on how based on how hard it was for me to figure out how to do this recording, yep, I'm glad I had my husband around for that. <laughs> <laughs> Handy team. Uh, so, 
um, Richard, you, I mean, in fact, you both spoke about really the, you know, how useful it is to work with something fast. So I'm guessing, I'm, I mean, how, how was the repertory developed in order to make it suitable for veterinary use? You know, I'm, I'm imagining a vet out there, you know, seeing an animal in practice, in, you know, why is the repertory useful? Well, that's, that's a really great question. Um, as Richard already mentioned, the first thing that we had to do in order to get it ready into the form it is now was to eliminate all the symptoms that we can't really see in animals that aren't speaking your language, you know, any non-human animals. It could also apply to, say, uh, some human patients perhaps who are comatose or even infants, just as, a, just as an aside. But so first we took those symptoms out. Uh, they'd be like, uh, because of the physiology is different, so it'd be a symptom we're not seeing in our veterinary practices, or it might be, say, dreams or sensations, things mm -hmm. that we, we just can't know about our yeah. animals. So why have to go through all those, those rubrics if we don't need them? Then we'd add cool. in others that, uh, con that also af that apply to the animal um, from the other sources. You know, we thought, you know, uh, there's certain even body parts that people don't have, um, anal glands, for example. And, and so we found cool. some things that seem to refer to that and put that in there. A few um, people have them. And one thing that we did do when you're when you're thinking about how Kent does aggravations, he often does particular aggravations, whereas Bunninghausen did some general aggravation, general modalities. So we made sure to put all the Kent Kentian modalities where they belong in the particular section. So ah. people wondering how how we could mix Kent and Bunninghausen. Well, that that's how we did it. We kept Kent the way he meant it to be. And then the okay. Bunninghausen modality were in the general. So I'm guessing, lastly, oh, to, sorry, yep. Yeah. Oh, the Not very last thing was just changing languages. The language, for example, you didn't want arms and legs. You, instead you had um, posterior extremities and anterior extremities so that we know, you know what you mean by an arm or a hand or a finger or a hawk or a stifle instead. So we had to change the terminology. And then the one last thing was uh, menses is considered equivalent to estrus in animals. It's not the same period during the reproductive cycle, but it's a discharge. And the discharge is very important during the health of the patient. So that mm -hmm. menses equals estrus in the new world. Wow. Okay. So that changes completely the way that you would go and look at that, basically. Fantastic. Okay, well, I mean, that, I, I'm imagining, you know, a veterinary opening, you know, the repertory going, okay, now I finally know what to look at and how to look at it, um, which uh, leads me to, you know, think, how is the repertory organized? Because, you know, sometimes repertories change quite a bit, uh, you know, internally. So, you know, what should a veterinary expect when they open it up? How, we, how, how, we, how is it structured? Well, the, the um, repertory, the, the one that Boning, the Boger edited, the printed book, is, is much like Kent's in terms of anatomical sections. However, the order is a little bit different. Uh, for example, generalities, he, he puts it as sensations and complaints. It's kind of in the middle of the book. So the, mm -hmm. the, the book form that we did, and it, as it will be on the computer form, uh, uh, application, we moved it to be like Kent's. So generalities is at the back. So it'll be familiar to people. So it's pretty yeah. much organized the same way. There are some differences in the sense of, of the way, uh, for example, what comes to mind is that if you look in Kent's, if it has something to do with bowel movements, you know, you'll find um, the rectum section will have all about the functions of the rectum, but and sure. uh, They'll have constipation and, and diarrhea and so on there. Whereas Boger uh, edition of the Boninghausen puts those sit rubrics under the stool. So there right. are some differences like that, but we, that we kept the same. I, I didn't, I don't think we felt like we should really change that order um, no. because that's the way it, it had, Boger had organized it. So anyway, that becomes almost like a personal choice. So there are yeah. some differences like that you have to get familiar with. I would say the primary thing is following Boninghausen's um, 
practice and experience, and that is that Bonninghausen in his writings tells us that one of his discoveries was that in studying provings and patience, he found that when there was a modality, for example, worse from movement or worse from temperature or whatever, that he found that that modality would apply to many symptoms a patient had and that sometimes they weren't quite aware of it or hadn't paid attention to it. But that was a, an important discovery on his part. He also applied that to concomitants. So when he organized his information, then he, in a sense, more generalized the modalities of concomitants. And we retained that format because that's what's so very useful to our veterinarians. In other words, um, you may be presented with an animal say it has a modality like worse for movement, but we can't tell as clearly as it would be in a human being what that modality refers to, you see. Mm. So the advantage of the Boninghausen approach is that he set those modalities in a section off to apply to the whole section. For example, if you go into uh, one of the anatomical sections, that not all of them have this, most of them do though, where they'll have aggravations and ameliorations and concomitants set aside as their own section within that part. So for example, if you're into the fever section and say it's, it's worse from, from some modality, that modality applies to every rubric in that section. Ah. So that's the method of the Boger Boninghausen. Well, it's very useful for veterinarians. Because again, our limitation of not being able to define as clearly what the modality refers to. Does that make sense? Totally, totally. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It, it's just a different way that a veterinary will look at a repertory compared. Um, yeah, it's really the Boninghausen method, but we're sense. using it as it's a, it's very useful for veterinarians because of our particular um, informational limitations. In, you know, the, the the way you're describing it, I'm almost imagining how how difficult an homeopathic vet's life would have been before this kind of repertory. <laughs> you, know, you, know, like, you know, there's just so much more work involved because the information you want to get to, it's not as easy no. to funnel through, I guess. No, and if you go back and look at the historical records, which I've, I've done quite a bit in my teaching, uh, go back and find uh, the journals and the books the veterinarians, homeopathic veterinarians produced, most of them are not using repertories. They just yeah. learn materi medica. Memorize it. Yeah. Back in those days when people were intelligent and uh, were able to memorize. <laughs> You're talking about before cell phones and before. Uh, yeah, 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 and, yeah. Yeah. Be before Ask Google era. You know? Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Okay, so, um, okay, well, I mean, now that we're getting a little bit more in depth, um, uh, and by by the way, uh, Richard, I mean you, you mentioned uh, you know your teaching. Uh, it, you still teach actively these days, right? I'm doing less than I did. Uh, I, this this uh, uh, program for veterinarians that we started. The first one was uh, uh, finished in 1992, and uh, it was it's a year long program for veterinarians. We meet five times in the year for uh, four day meetings. Uh, where they're trained in homeopathy and then in between they have assignments and casework and we have an on okay. online forum to help them with their learning and so on. Great. So that course is still going. A few years ago, three or four years ago, I turned it over to another person as a director. Mm -hmm. I'm heading out next week to teach in it. Oh, great. But I'm one of the teachers now. I'm not the director. Ah, okay. And, uh, yeah. I still do an, uh, an annual meeting every, every March uh, for the veterinarians that have taken training with us. Okay, uh, great. So uh, less than I did. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Uh, I was just going to say maybe um, I will post with the webinar the information so people can go and have a look because that's sure. obviously quite an interesting uh, thing. Yeah. I, I think especially things like forums and you know just creating interaction with people who are obviously mm -hmm. you know um, vets. So fantastic, fantastic. Um, okay, question. I I actually noted this down because um, I, I mean. I'm not a professional homeopath, but I, I often get into conversation with homeopaths, and I've been hearing uh, a lot about people talking about the cross-references in your repertory. So I'm not sure why the discussion is there, so what's that all about? 
Well, that's a really, I think it's my favorite part of the repertory. Uh-huh. Um, because I used to, especially when you use more than one repertory, but even within the same one, you'll find, especially Boger Boninghouse, and it's, it's actually a compilation itself from before we got it. Boger made it a compilation. So you'll find a rubric in one place that isn't quite perfect for what you need. But if with our cross-references, we've linked it as we're going through and making this repertory, we're thinking, oh, wait a minute, that's really similar to this rubric. So we made a cross-reference so you can go find it, and then you might say, yes, that's much better. That's what I want. And the remedies aren't, aren't necessarily the same, even though the wording is very similar, like the difference between a rubric calling something dark versus another rubric calling something black. You know, they can be very similar. It depends on what you see, what the lighting is that day. Um, or another example is you might find uh, your animals, your patient's worth with physical exertion. And so we cross-references reference ascending stairs aggravate. You know, that kind of physical exertion could yeah. certainly fit. But again, the remedies were different. And we thought, well, we could just put those two together, but we weren't sure you know sometimes the remedies really fit one or the other and we didn't want to mess yeah. with what the original masters had said so the answer was to do a cross-reference and then you could find what you needed and that, that way it, you know really improved our accuracy using those cross-references so we're very happy with those yeah i, I can imagine and I, i'm i'm looking forward to seeing it in action um, well, might, uh, marco let me add in it's important i think for people to understand is in the computer form of the repertory, the great ease of use because uh, when he's talking about moving to another rubric, you can do it by simply clicking on it. Yeah. 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 You don't have to go find it. You click it, it takes you right to it. And then a lot of the times when you go there, all right, Wendy, when you get to the other one, you can go back to the first one if you want. You can just click right back. That's right. Yeah. So it makes it very, very fast and usable. Yeah. 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 Um, quick question. So. Would you say this kind of cross-reference work would be done by a vet when they're actually on site, or it's something that a vet will perhaps do once they're back home using the software? Or? That's a good question. I, I do my best thinking back home. Yeah, yeah I think I it, it's certainly amenable, amenable to be used on site, um, especially if you're really, you really know the Materia Medica. you got that in your head. But, yeah, yeah. I, I work best back home. Yeah. I guess it's oh, personal. I wanted to bring up I wanted to bring up one other thing that I forgot to mention when we talked about the organization of the repertory. Kent yeah. only has an has an extremity section that's just general. And so what we did was we put that section, those rubrics, in the posterior extremities. So if you ever work looking for something that you think should be a general, look in the posterior section in the New World. Very useful. Very useful information. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, I guess uh, another easy question is, uh, I mean, wh- what, you know, what's the feedback, you know, that you've received from veterinaries that have used, uh, you know, both uh, the physical version of the book and I guess also uh, the software version because just so our, our listeners know, you know, we now have, uh, you know, the – uh, the repertory that is available, but it's been available in MacRep for a while, so you can also get it from there. You can use it, you know, there as well. If you're listening to us using that software, it's available, you know, from them as well. So, um, you know, you're welcome yeah, to go and check been, it out there as well. It's been in the Mac repertory package, what, about three years, Wendy, maybe something like that? Yeah, say? that sounds about right. Three or four years. I'd have to check on that. Yeah. yeah, I would say that most most people I know are using the computer form, but the book does sell. In fact, our 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 book form of the repertory has been translated into German, and it sells better than the English version. <laughs> Surprisingly, yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we've we've had a nice feedback from it. I have to say, uh, there hasn't been a large volume of feedback that I have received. I've seen some very positive things. I've seen occasional criticisms. Uh, that usually have to do with them not knowing how to find their way around it. Like we're talking about, right. uh, you know, not being familiar with the Boger Bogenhausen layout. That does have to be understood as, as we talked about. So uh, I would say generally you know, positive. Um, 
I, I find that going to some meetings and so on, though, I find that many veterinarians, like I talked about earlier, the historical use of homeopathy by veterinarians, that many veterinarians that I meet don't use repertories. Mm. So <clears throat> there's going to be a smaller group, but those that are using it seem to be very um, uh, favorably inclined towards it. What do you say, Wendy? You think hear something like that? I have seen that um, people seem unfamiliar sometimes with the use of the repertory online. Yeah, um, though uh, the positives I've received is that they like the definition. There's some definitions of old terms that we put in there. Mm -hmm. um, and they also like to, they've been used to combining equivalent rubrics and now they don't really have to. You know, they're, they're, it's, cool. it's in there. Yeah. So yeah, some some positive and and also I have, I found that they just need to learn better how to use the repertory. So yeah. hopefully we've made it more straightforward. Yeah. And now yeah. that it's coming coming into your your uh, software package, Marco, I think we're going to hear a lot more feedback. <laughs> we're going to see. <laughs> yeah. No. And and, I, and we are really looking forward to it. You know, as, as I said at the beginning, you know, our core aim really is to just help homeopaths do the job as well and as quickly as, as possible. And I think speed, as, as horrible as that could be, is becoming a necessity in our day and age. You know, people are busy all the time. You know, sometimes you, you, you need to go and see so many patients and so many people, animal, you know, in, in a short amount of time that really the purpose of the software and having books in the software is exactly that. It's, I need to save a lot of people here, you know, how quickly but successfully can I do it? Um, and I think you, you've actually caught a point here. It's all about the repertory in the sense that if you have a large knowledge on a Materia Medica, you're going to be great regardless. But yeah. the point of the repertory is to just give you help to just get there faster, um, be, depending on the time you have. Right, exactly. Right. So it's, you know, right, the help. repertory really is the repertory really is just to lead you there to the materia medica. It's really supposed to just be an index. It's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I hope that, you know, education wise worldwide, people will push more and more of this because, you know, I, I think they go hand in hand. You need to learn your repertories. You need to know your materia medica. They go together. Um, and you know, you know even if, even if a veterinarian doesn't have the inclination to use a repertory very much, it's useful as a tool in the sense that, say they want to learn, say they work with a particular type of animal, an emergency, dairy cattle or something, and they're dealing with a particular problem, they can find a rubric that applies. Now they know the group of remedies to study in material medicine. Exactly. Yeah. That's very helpful. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That's, yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's hopefully how they'll use it. Um, <laughs> Okay, so if I could ask just one last question. Again, I'm imagining uh, someone, you know, listened to us, wanted to use the repertory. So what is, what has been so far your experience of using the repertory in your cases? Oh, it's been a great relief. And, you know, imagine just having to wade through all the rubrics that you don't need. It kind of makes you a little bit blinkered. So you, you might miss the one you actually need, whereas now every single one, every single one can apply to our patient. So that's been a big relief for me. It's helped me dial into the center of the case much quicker. And so I've, I've been really happy using it. Fantastic. Fantastic. So I, I, I would say, you know, the summary in my head is, you know, as long as you know more or less how bedding gas and repertory bug edition works, and as long as you know you know, you can expect speed and ease of use. That's why, basically, your repertory is useful for veterinary. So. Maybe, Marco, I just had the thought, uh, at some point in the future, maybe we should do a little, another little webinar that just shows people how to um, use it in a more practical way. Like, here's how it's laid out. Here's how we analyze a case. Most certainly. I, I think, yeah, uh, let's absolutely do that. And I imagine that, you know, the knock-on effect of this webinar anyway will be people going, okay, now I know a bit about it. I want to know more. So, uh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And uh, if, if I may ask, guys, um, as we're coming to, you know, the end of our wonderful conversation today, um, if people want to find out a little bit more about you guys, is there a website or somewhere where they can, you know, come and find out about, you know, the repertory, what you guys are doing? Well, um, 
I don't have, I have, to, on my website, I have a page that just describes the, okay. the book, you know, and yeah. mentions that it doesn't have a lot of detail about it. Um, I do have, um, if any, any veterinarians are interested and want to contact um, me, uh, I do have a number of um, videos I produce for using it in, as a MEC repertory program. You know, I mean, it's going to be similar, I imagine, in, in yours. Um, yeah. The, the, the names of the remedies may be a little bit different in terms of their abbreviation, but I think it's going to sure. function, I assume it's going to function pretty much the same. Yeah, so, I think that, that would work. Maybe five or six hours of videos on how to use it in the repertory that might be useful to people. Training. Okay, so if they get in touch with you, they, they can probably get hold yeah, of these videos, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. That'll be useful. Great. And of, course, and of course, remember, there's the professional course in veterinary homeopathy for any vets that want further training. Yeah. And that's the website, P-I-V-H. Yeah, P-I-V-H. They, they named it after I turned it over to the new person. They insisted on changing the name to the Pitcairn Institute. I was embarrassed nice. by that's that, right. but, you know, it, it makes sense because... That's what people know. So, <laughs> so it's Makes sense to me. Of veterinary homeopathy, PIVH. Yeah. And may I ask, um, Richard, as there may be people listening to us from abroad, is the course also available online, or would they physically need to be attending? So far, it has been attendance. Okay. Just we have had people, people coming from Switzerland and from uh, Israel and from South America and so on, but. But yes, right. that is an inconvenience to have to travel. But so far, we have felt like the in-person interaction is the most effective. It always is. It always is, mm -hmm. without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Well, guys, thank you so much for this uh, short introduction. It's been an absolute pleasure, and I hope our listeners will like it too. And uh, we we'll very much look forward to the next one to go more in-depth into this amazing repertory. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Marco.